He loves you. And he wants to reveal his purpose for you. But his purpose for you is through the the veil of your tears. You will find his presence through the veil of your tears. And each one who died and shares their experience in heaven or hell has done so, so through the veil of their tears. And that's always where we will find his presence so that he can save the lost, that he can heal through the veil of his tear, your tears that are his tears. For the, thank you, Ammon, perfect. For the sake of time, you know, we've got 30 minutes this morning. You two can pass that back and forth. Um, I highly encourage you to get their books because their stories are fascinating, but we only have so much time. I think I'd rather talk about the Father and Jesus and what you guys perceive he's saying to the church today and to the world today. Let's do this, though. And, and it's hard to tell a story these, this dramatic so quickly. Why don't, why don't both of you give like a two to three minute testimony? They can get the books and hear the story of what happened, and then we'll jump into some contemporary questions. How's that sound? Ivan, you want to go first? Sure. Reader's Digest version, I died, went to hell, heaven, and I'm back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I was a backslidden kid. I was in Bible college, got out of Bible college, met somebody, and messed up my life, and it just spiraled down. And by the time I was 26 years of age, I was pretty messed up. Ended up with a blood clot in my leg. Make a long story short, I was in the hospital for about 10 days back then. They released me from the hospital. I went home. I died. I went straight to hell. Believe me, it's real. You know, one of the things you talked about this morning that I heard was hope. In hell, there's no hope. It's the most hopeless place you could ever imagine. So while I'm in hell, to give you the Reader's Digest version of it real quick, is that while I'm in hell, a voice rang out and it said, it's not his time. You must let him go. I made a promise to his mother. If it wasn't for my mother's prayers, and at that time in my life, as much as I needed prayer, when she prayed for me about 22,000 times, I was released and then sent to heaven, greeted by an angel in heaven and taken all through heaven, shown a lot of things through heaven and shown a lot of things about the earth from the beginning way into the future. That is, that is awesome. Now, you actually live in heaven right now. You live in San Diego, California. Close to it. Uh, just got voted recently by Travel Leisure Magazine, number one weather climate on earth. Well, you know what our tagline is in San Diego? Let's hear it. America's finest city. Really? I didn't get any applause on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I talk about your book. Um, I've, your book got me. I wept through chapter one. Uh, you didn't see this coming. Why don't you tell your Reader's Digest version, you have a surgery, and next thing you know, you're seeing Jesus Christ. You know, it's a lot of people want to hear about heaven, but uh, I love to talk about the creator of heaven, the creator. But what happened to me was that I had been in a place of despair. Um, my wife and I sitting to my left here, uh, Renee, we sat in a coffee shop. I had been on the top of the world, gotten back from Washington, D.C. to launch a drug that might uh, be a cure for Alzheimer's. The FDA pulled that drug, but what was the worst of all was my daughter. Many strokes, and I saw her. I saw her dying in front of my eyes. And who she was, she lost her childhood through these mini strokes and uh, we were in the coffee shop and I was saying, Renee, where's God? And I went back and sat on the bed and cried out to the ceiling, to nothingness, saying, Lord, this time you've got to show up. I was ordained as a minister. I worked in the church, taught in the church. Where are you? And uh, two weeks after that coffee shop, I was dead. 
I uh, went bicycling up the coast in San Diego. I had come back from a long trip and my calf started hurting. I couldn't breathe. Went to the doctor and uh, collapsed, went immediately to the ER. And they found six blood clots that had traveled by this time because I let it go all the way to my lung. Six pulmonary emboli. And then a patient next to me had what's called MRSA, which is a drug-resistant bacterial strain. Caused further clotting. So now I was clotting throughout my body to the point where the doctor could not withdraw blood from my arm. And I started convulsing on the bed and flopping like a fish out of water. And then I was still. I was in a place of foreign place. To cry out the name of Jesus. So I cried his name. And the next thing I was cheek to cheek with this figure and he leaned his face into mine and I felt his bristles against my right cheek and I knew it was Jesus and he whispered in my ear two words trust me I had never been a trusting person and I caved I didn't think I could look into the eyes of Jesus. And then he lifted me up and turned me face to face. And I looked into the eyes of love. I looked into the eyes of love. And they tumbled into every dark place within me, exposing the light of Jesus. And that is my story in a nutshell. The other night having dinner with Sean, the team he brought in, John Burke was there. Has John's book sold around a million copies now? Has it gotten that high yet? Yeah, it's well past that. And even now for a book that's five or six years old, it sells probably about twelve to 1,300 units a week. I mean, it just, it sells like crazy. Well, you know me, I love... Meeting people and prophesying. I think, I think prophesying is so fun, especially when you don't know someone. And I started prophesying over John, and I, I was laughing. I said, John, God picked a skeptic to write a book on heaven. Yep. Uh, John was a severe skeptic. And I said, did you ever see this coming for you? And he said, no. So in John's book, Imagine Heaven, that sold a lot of copies, which is unusual in this business. That's not normal to sell that many books. Uh, what is coming to the surface, what's five or six years after he wrote the book, it's not really about uh, heaven. It's not what's hitting people. It's what you just said. It's the healer, the lover of our souls. It's Jesus. So now I want to I want to turn to the conversation because there's people in this room, people listening to us. World's pretty bumpy right now. We need Jesus. We need hope. We need love. Sean, the father showed me while Randy was talking. He's he's sovereignly putting you in a position where you're in the publishing business. And what I'm watching with you is two things. I'm watching you being transformed by the day. And I'm watching you be really a middle person to get the message of a lot of this NDE, near-death experiences, out. I think it has to do more with the person of Jesus than it does what that angel looked like, what the Crystal River looked like. What do you, why do you think, because I know you didn't see this coming, Sean. When you interviewed me seven years ago, you thought I was weird. Now I think you're weird. Um, <laughs> What's the father been? Also a true story. Yes. <laughs> that is a funny story. Uh, what's the father showing you about all this NDE stuff? Why is he doing this? Why is he putting you on a platform to promote so many of these authors? Uh, I, you know, I think not unlike John Burke, I was very skeptical of this sort of thing. You know, 10 years ago on my journey, I would have thought Ivan and Randy were crazy people. And, and I would have run the other way. Uh, Ivan said they, they are a little crazy. Um, but I think it takes somebody who is skeptical and who's really going to try to walk from a place of discernment 
to test things and make sure people are sharing things from the Lord, sharing true stories. And so uh, I feel like as, as I've patiently uh, carved out a space in publishing, I've just been given an assignment to bring people who are sharing true and pure messages and also who have uh, pure intentions. You know, some people want a platform, they want fame, and they're chasing the wrong things. Uh, God just given me a great group of people around me who uh, they're in it for the Lord. They want to see people saved. They want to see people when we're all in heaven. And so uh, it's just a great stewardship assignment to bring really wonderful messages to bear. And, and I think the seasonality of it, people need hope. People are desperate. We all lost so much in the past few years. Uh, and we're just at a place where these messages can go all over the globe. We all got cell phones in our pockets no matter where we are in the world. And um, these, these, are, you know, these heaven stories are universal messages that uh, just connect in a way uh, that other kinds of testimonies don't. And so it, it's very timely and it's for the season that we're in. Ivan, if let's say the Lord taps you on the shoulder, you're an older man and he says, Ivan, you have run your race. You're about to come home with me forever, but I'm gonna give you one more opportunity to share with a group of people, whatever you want to share, Ivan, about what you've learned about me. What, do, what would you say? I mean, you had such a radical story, but you love the God that you encountered there. It's obvious he's in your eyes. I can see him. What would you share to a group of people about what you've experienced along the way with him? I think the first thing I would tell you is that there's so much love, if you can understand that, if you, if you could just grasp the love that you get from God, if you can understand that that love is there so strong. I mean, I know we all talk about it. You know, he actually gave his son up to die on a cross for us. And when you think about that, and when you understand that kind of love, and as a parent, you understand that love, that's such a strong love to have, your love you have for your children. But the next thing is, is to be blunt with you, this is what I see in this room. I see the first century church. I want to discuss this a little bit outside. This is a time where God is saying, I want my people, my people prepared I want my people to go out there and start doing the signs, miracles, and wonders that I, it, my son did here on earth. And that's what I keep seeing. And that's the most important thing right now for me is for people to understand, listen, it's time for you to get ignited. It's time for you to come alive. It's time for you to be doing the things that we should have been doing all along uh, for the last couple hundred years at least. And so that's part of the message that God gave me when I came back is that, listen, you need to get people excited and get them back out there and get them doing something because it's not about the people that are up here. It's about you out there. Tell about the experience you had when uh, you quickly mentioned it in the lobby with me, what the father allowed you to see and how the multiplication aspect, we were talking about discipleship and multiplication. Tell about your experience and why you're passionate about discipleship. I'm passionate about it, for, well, for a lot of reasons. One is that I know that this is what we're supposed to do. You see, I was able to see things from the past, and I watched the first century church, and I saw the things happening. Listen, the reason why the church grew by 3,500 people a day, it wasn't because they had the best speakers. It was because the people came together. They didn't have a Bible. They didn't have somebody up there necessarily that was doing this great announcement and speakers and everything. They had people that came together. They spoke together. They worshiped together. They did things. And then they went out and whenever they got a word from somebody about what they can do that Jesus said they could do, they went out and did it. They duplicated it. And once they duplicate, here's what happens. If you go out there and you lay hands on a perfectly good stranger and you lay hands on them and then God heals that person right there on the spot, don't you think they want to know what it is that you've got? And when they realize it's not something you have, it's something that he has through you. And when you start realizing that you can operate in this and start growing in this, oh, you have no idea. I know, well, I'll just be real blunt. I'm just going ahead and prophesy what I, what I saw. Is that okay? We're not really big on the prophetic, but go ahead. <laughs> Take a risk. Finally, go for it. I'm going to go for it. Okay. Yeah. Just look at each other in here because in two years as it doubles and three years as it triples, but not because of the amount of people. It's not the people. It's the quality of the people that are going to be coming in here because you 
are the ones that are going to go out there. You're going to get them saved. You're going to help them so they can get filled with the Holy Spirit. You're going to lay hands on them. You're going to watch miracles. Some of you in this room are going to start raising the dead. And I'm not talking about raising the dead from a church, but I'm talking about actually raising the dead. There's the demons that are out there in the world. You're going to be casting those out. I already see that. I see it happening. But two years from now, it's going to double. And three years from now, it'll triple. But it's the quality. It's the type of the training, the teaching. Look out, man. Uh, I'm getting a word right now. Is Kim Berg in here? She's not here. The father showed me, and this is being recorded, that there's a realignment happening with our food pantry, food bank. I see that greatly expanding. Alex, where's Alex Rodriguez? Will you come stand up front with your wife, please? Will y'all come stand up here? Woo! Woo! Let's go crazy for these two, please. Woo! You can sit here. So there was a pastor that Sean uh, brought this past week. His name's Troy Brewer. Just for sake of time, I'll go quick. God showed me a lot being with him. Will you face a congregation? Will y'all re- uh, release, uh, point your hands towards them? You have served this house faithfully. You've served Berea faithfully. And there, there's a realigning. There's, there, God's just doing such a fresh work. He's connecting the up, in, and out. But when it comes to the out... It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look different. And I see an enormous food pantry. I mean big, a huge warehouse. And, and you, you too have been so faithful and you have such uh, an open uh, doorway into the Hispanic command, uh, community, Alex. You are so favored by the Father. And I just hear out, 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 out ministry into the streets, out ministry into other countries. I see a partnership coming with Troy with his orphanages. It is out, 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 church without walls. And I see people being drawn into this house coming from our out ministry. And God's going after the least of these, uh, the least of these, the least of these, the least of these. I bless you, Alex and Ashley. You would just be faithful to your assignment here. Father, we just, we just say yes to whatever your plans are over this house as it comes to out. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Um, I did not plan on asking you this. I am really excited about this question. You and me had a conversation when we did some filming. I don't remember where it was. It might have been Charlotte that night. So this is a house of paradox. So let's take Romans eleven twenty two. Therefore, consider both the kindness and the severity of God. So we didn't know each other. And a fun God story, the night before I met you in Charlotte, there was a UPS package on my kitchen table. I think I've told you this. Sean sends me so many books, and I love it. And I started reading this book, and honestly, I didn't even really notice the author. And I'm weeping in my room over chapter one. You 31 principles of what you learn in heaven, right? And the first principle was Jesus loves each of us as though we're the only person on earth. And I'm just, I'm li- well, the next night, I'm like, wait a minute. I just read your book last night. <laughs> and so we got to talking, and then you uh, endorsed my book, and you read it. And you made some comments to me, and one of the comments you made, you said, Chad, you have to know God to write that, because when you were in heaven, you had an experience where you understood not only the kindness and love of the Father, but the judgments of God. And unless I'm making this up, I'm pretty sure you told me even like a dark cloud, you had an experience where you, you I think you even asked, what is that? Am I, am I right here? Absolutely. Tell, okay, Romans eleven twenty two. A lot of people want to talk about the kindness of God while just saying, hey, <laughs> I don't really want to get into the judgments of God. What is that all about? Tell about your experience and how real that verse is of what you've learned. And I, and I, I said to either you or to, to Sean uh, that, you know, he gets it. You get it. Because you can't understand the seeming dichotomy between the kindness and the judgment of God until you realize the love and the familiarity of Jesus in your life. So when I was in heaven, I saw these, I was with Jesus the entire time, and I saw this rolling kind of thunder, this impending storm. And I didn't realize what that was about until later because I was just taking it in. But all during this time, I was in the comforting presence and the embrace of my Lord and Savior. 
And then this came into heaven and it was rolling through. And I didn't know quite what it was because I had realized an awe that I had never perceived prior to this time. And then after I had returned, I prayed about this. I said, Lord, what did you show me? And it was showing me the impending judgment. The storm was that which would come first to cleanse this place where we're at now. Because, you know, after a storm, there's a cleansing process. You walk in and you can breathe in the fresh air that has cleared out the air. And then comes new life, birth through the storm, which is that, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and people coming into knowing the Lord for the first time. And for those who have wanted to know him more, being increased and knowing his presence in a fuller way, in a full way. And then that he would open our spiritual eyes, like Elijah would see the the chariots of fire around him when God opened his spiritual eyes, that that would happen, and it's happening in this church. It's happening here. He wants to reveal his presence to you because if you don't know his presence fully, then all you will feel is the judgment. Because you'll feel the angst and the anger and the fretting and the fear. But when you feel the presence of God, I felt like the storm would do nothing but embrace me against all that the world could throw at me. No pressure at all on you, but this, it was this morning, early this morning, I woke up. And I feel like the Lord showed me that you had a word for this house. No pressure at all. Just don't mess this up, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then talking to you this morning, I, I can tell that it seems like God's been speaking to you for a while about us. There's a connection here. We, we found it that night in Charlotte. Why don't you just be free, release whatever the Father's showing you about us, this community, the Garden Greenville? That you here in this church, here and now, you are the core. And you are going to be ministering even in a greater way to those within the community, bringing others into the body of Christ. But you have to know his presence first. If you don't know his presence, he can't use you fully. So I want you to please close your eyes. Dear Lord, in the name of Yeshua, release your presence. Open those spiritual eyes that these who are sitting here can look into your eyes and see the eyes of love that they might know you and be forever changed. They might fall before you of tears of joy, knowing you, not just as a person, but as their friend and their father and their author and their judge. I release that now in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, knowing, Lord, that whatever we pray, believing, and there are those of you right now who are looking into the eyes of love, and you're looking into the eyes of love for the veil of your tears, because it is in the darkest place in the depth of your darkness, of your greatest suffering, that you will see the full glory and likeness of Yeshua, your Lord, your friend, your Savior, your King. 
In Jesus' name, amen. It's about three years ago, Jamie Galloway said to me, you remind me so much of Troy Brewer. I said, who's Troy Brewer? <laughs> and Brian Schwartz called and said, bro, you got to meet Troy Brewer. Well, Wendy and I were in California a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, and I had a dream. We were at a restaurant. And did y'all get a chance? Have y'all know Troy? Have you? Y'all, you met Troy? And in the dream, two weeks ago, Troy Brewer was sitting in a restaurant, and he was smiling at me. And uh, I had never seen a picture of Troy, and I Googled, and I'm like, goodness gracious, Lord. I mean, it was, he looked just like he does in my dream, but I didn't, I didn't know him. And so I've been sitting on this for three or four days, and Wendy and I are in the process right now of uh, moving a few miles away from our house and downsizing, and moving is like a demonic assault <laughs> of 10 hells on everyone's emotions. And so in the middle of getting in the flesh 15 times uh, a day, both of us, I just been moving around talking to God a lot. And he's been showing me uh, why he gave me a, a dream of Troy in my dream. And you talk about the church tripling in three years. The father is really putting his hand on the out ministry in this house, out into the marketplace, out into the least of these. And so what's going to begin to happen, it's not something new. We're already well on our way. We're going to Berea today. With God's grace, it's going to really blow onto that. It already is. Like right now, my legs just got instantly cold. I feel like I'm sitting in a river right now. Um, do y'all sense his presence right there? Yeah. And uh, while Randy was praying, I've never seen this before. I saw myself in a, in a leper colony and I heard... Troy the other day talking about that. A true biblical first century church is just really good at three things. Up, in, and out. Amen. Up is a corporate and in the homes culture of intimacy with the Father where you don't know where you begin and where he ends. It's just pure communion. In is a true discipling community. And we're about to take a journey into an out and he's going to send us to the least of these. All over the place, all over the world. I, I saw missions budget in this house increasing. And what you're going to see is a lot of wealth begin to be accrued here in this community and the least of these at the, at the exact same time. And that is a sign of a biblical church, the wealthy and the poor. And I see what's called these go teams in my spirit. Some go teams will be in the Gaffney, Berea, Anderson, other places. Some go teams will be partnering with Troy all over the world. So what I want to do before I just uh, ask Ivan just to speak a blessing over us and have a time of altar ministry, I want to speak a blessing as the father of this house into the out. If you burn for out, let me clearly define this. I don't just mean serving the least of these. I also mean serving in the marketplace, owning your own business, seeing your staff as those you're supposed to disciple and your customers as your congregation. I just see this out, church without walls thing. If that burns in you, I want you to stand up right now. Francisco, come here. I want you to take the microphone and I want you to pray heaven down and I want you to usher us into an absolute corporate and communal yes to this out. You pray however you're led. <laughs> classic, classic chat. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Oh, my God. Beautiful God. Beautiful Father. It's just amazing. This, this time is just the greatest times on earth. We were appointed for this time. I mean, it, it may be after these three years of difficulties and storms, like they were saying, we are ready. We are ripped, dear Lord. And dear Lord, we just love you so much. And we just, we just... We just groan for your presence and thank you for that presence in this place and this house, the house of healing, the house of reconciliation, dear Lord. So we are just engaging now in a journey with you and a journey where it's leading to that church of the first century. Dear Lord, thank you for these blessings. Thank you for this anointing that you are bringing here, but also 
your Holy Spirit moving everywhere, moving in Iran, moving in Afghanistan, moving in Ukraine, moving in Europe, moving in America, moving in Canada, dear Lord. <sighs> your plans, your plan of redemption, your glory be just spent in this, in this place, dear Lord. Thank you for this greatness that you are bringing, but also for the healing and your, uh, your hand over all of this, dear Lord, we have, I, this week, it's been so great because the, your, the pouring of your Holy Spirit is so immense. Like child was saying, I was with a patient and this patient was just broken. She was so lonely and she lost her husband and I, I, I prayed for that lady and something just came off. And she was just crying there and saying, wow, it's so beautiful this that you bring to this place. And I have seen that. The hands of people in business, the hands of people in the marketplace being healing hands. The extension of your glory and your redemption and your healing, dear Lord. We proclaim over this house, we proclaim and we decree that America and the world will be saved for you, dear Lord. So your glory, your glory will expand to the whole universe. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.